So uh, we have many, many questions, and I hope that we can get to all of them, but I'm not sure. We have uh, about 600 people still attending here. I know a lot of people have had trouble with their audio, and I really, really apologize for that. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I think that some people might have a, a not great internet connection, but I just wanted to remind everyone that there is going to be a recording of this webinar, and we're going to have the uh, PowerPoint slides sent out in the next few days. Um, so the one question that's come up many, many times, and it came up in one of the last webinars we did is whether um, whether this program replaces uh, maximize my social security. And um, I guess I'll, I'll say that uh, it's, that's not exactly true. Um, maximize my social security is a standalone product that is devoted uh, uh, precisely to just maximizing your highest lifetime benefits. Um, all of the functionality or almost all of the functionality of uh, Maximize My Social Security is built into Maxify, but Maxify is a full-fledged financial planning software. Um, so if you're looking to just look at Social Security, Maximize is your tool. Um, so with that, I hope that answers that question. Um, I will, uh, uh, let me just start an uh, asking, uh, uh, sending some of these questions over to you, Dad. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, let's see, what's, let me just figure out a good one here. Does Maxify determine uh, whether it's advantageous to do Roth conversions and or to optimally do dra uh, drawdowns uh, timing-wise from regular IRAs, Roth IRAs, and taxable accounts, factoring in taxes, and IRMAA? Okay, so let me just deal with the first part of that, and then we'll get back to the second part of that. Uh, question, Alex. So if you click here on alternative, the answer is yes, uh, certainly for Roth conversions. I, I didn't hear the full uh, second part of the question, but we'll get to that. Uh, if you click on a profile and you say add alternative profile and you call this um, Roth uh, conversion. So now you've got this new convert uh, profile and it shows right up here. It says Roth conversion. You're now this profile. And then you say, well, what if uh, Dan were to uh, do a conversion. So it comes down, down here to retirement accounts. We're going to modify the inputs and we're going to come down to this um, question, which is about Roth conversions. And you say, uh, can add a conversion amount. So maybe Roth, uh, maybe Dan wants to convert, uh, uh, he has like 750,000, maybe he wants to convert uh, uh, 75,000 uh, for um, the next three years, and we're now going to save those inputs. And now I'm going to run that uh, report, and I'm going to compare it with the base report. So let's see if uh, this all works. And this is so this is like running a comparison. And what we're going to immediately see is whether this actually helps uh, Dan, and it does help Dan and Sue by. Uh, about fourteen thousand dollars. It's not a huge saver, be, saving because uh, it lowers taxes in the future, but it's going to raise their taxes in the short run. And you can do things like compare their taxes. You can click on, you know, their taxes and see that, gee, uh, with the Roth conversion, they're paying more taxes in the short run. Uh, eventually, they're going to pay, I think, less tax. Yeah, they're paying less taxes later on, but uh, in present value, it didn't help that much. It helped somewhat, $14,000. Why not make $14,000? So the, the answer is absolutely, we can, you can do uh, within the course of two minutes. I think that took me just about two minutes to analyze Roth conversion for yourself. Alex, what was the next part of that question? Uh, does Maxify determine, um, you know, optimal drawdowns? timing wise from regular IRAs and Roth IRAs and, and taxable accounts? Uh, yes, from, from uh, taxable accounts, it's determining it in the following sense. You can, uh, as part of the, uh, you know, if I go back here, for example, let me say I'm in the base profile and I hit the maximize plan. So one of the things you can do is you optimize over your initial date at which you start withdrawing your retirement account money on a smooth basis. 
So that's um, looking at all the different dates at which you might smart, start smooth withdrawals. If you have Roth money, as well as uh, taxable money, then you can tell it to optimize. It, it, this thing would give you an option to optimize over whether or not to take the Roth money first or second. You also can optimize over, over whether or not to take your retirement account money out as an annuity that's, um, uh, it would be a nominal annuity because uh, there, there are no, the insurance companies are no, no longer marketing inflation indexed annuities, fully inflation indexed annuities. They have something called graded annuities, which are not the same thing. So if you um, are running uh, uh, the optimization of annuitization, just be a little bit concerned that this is a nominal payment. And if, an, if inflation takes off, uh, you might get hurt on that annuity because the annuity would pay back in watered down dollars. But anyway, th there are three things right here that you can do to optimize your um, retirement account uh, decisions. But also you can uh, set up a profile where you uh, add additional contributions to your retirement account if, if your employer allows you to do that. Or if you're self-employed, you can uh, put in bigger IRA contributions. You can also specify special withdrawals. So let me just go back here to retirement accounts and just show you one other thing. Uh, so I told you about Roth um, decisions, but you can also specify, hey, for the next couple of years, uh, I want to take out uh, you know, $80,000 a year for a couple of years from my retirement account and maybe pay down my mortgage. If, if uh, this couple uh, had a mortgage, uh, we could then run the program and see whether, you know, not just taking out special withdrawals, but also telling the program under housing that um, there was going to be an extra payment, an extra pay down of the mortgage, because that's an option under housing when you specify a mortgage. So there's lots of things that are in the program that make it very simple to look at uh, uh, ex additional ways to. Um, to raise your lifetime spending. And certainly we deal with Roths, we deal with optimizing and helping you see what's best with your taxable money, how to handle it, your retirement account money, also how to handle the Roths, how, and uh, also whether to prepay your mortgage or whether to pay it off immediately by taking a big withdrawal right now and paying it off. Because if you haven't, you know, mortgage, um, mortgage refinance rates have not come down uh, to the degree to which um, bond, uh, like treasury bond rates have, have fallen. So uh, this may be the time to try and prepay a chunk of your mortgage or pay it off entirely if it's possible, because the best investment uh, available today, the safest best investment is paying off debts where, the, where you're facing a high interest rate. And uh, uh, that's a sure thing because every dollar you pay off, you get the return that you'd otherwise have to pay uh, interest on uh, that, uh, that dollar. So Alex, next question. So um, a couple people have uh, said that they have uh, non-covered pensions. Um, where do you enter that into the program? Non-covered social security pensions. So under your social security record, we would ask, uh, let's see. Um, oh, sorry, no, it's not there. We would ask about pensions we were to restore pensions because this is an item I dismissed earlier. And you'd say um, uh, teaching job and when the pension begins, maybe it starts at age 64, annual amount, maybe it's uh, $30,000 a year. And then um, is it covered by Social Security or not? If it's not covered, you put on no. So that's right, right here is where you specify that it's a not a covered pension. And if it came from a source from abroad, if that pension came from you're working in the UK for a while, for example, then it would be exempt from the GPO, the government pension offset provision, um, but it would not be exempt from the uh, windfall elimination provision. So we are very, very, very anal about Social Security. So as you would expect, we have these questions covered in the Maxify interface. Next question. Um so a number of people have asked whether the software takes into account uh, Medicare supplemental insurance, for example, or even uh, long-term care. Uh, where would you enter that, or, or does it do that? Yeah, under uh, health. Okay, so first of all, 
Uh, let me just point out that we do handle Medicare Part B premiums. You can specify information about Medicare, whether you're going to take Medicare, uh, whether you enroll or not. We assume you are going to re enroll. Enroll. How fast will the premiums for Part B uh, rise? And then when you run the base report and you look at the spending, there's a column that shows your Medicare premiums. And I think I pointed that out to you uh, earlier on. But then uh, the other thing is that under a household here, I've dismissed some items to keep the menu uh, pretty simple, but you can restore your special expenses. And here's where you would enter um, supplemental, you know, this is be, used to be called major medical, right? That was the old, na old name for it, ma major medical policy, which is your supplemental Medicare, uh, Medicare policy. It's not, there's no tax breaks. Maybe it's, uh, $8,000 a year. My mom's, when she passed away in 98, was about 6,000 a year. And, you know, when's it gonna end? Uh, after a certain number of years, and um, you would enter the number of years, or in a specific year, maybe it's gonna end when you're at your maximum age of life, which is way down here. So you can enter that um, special expense throughout your life. You can put it in today's dollars, so it's, or adjusted for inflation automatically. So it's $6,000 in today's dollars. So that may translate into $10,000 in 20 years if you had some positive inflation rate in the program because prices will rise. But in terms of today's dollars, it's really just 6,000. Next question, Alex. Yeah, this relates to a question uh, from Steve. Um, how would MaxFi consider unexpected expenses such as assisted living, nursing home, et cetera? Uh, is that done by creating a secondary profile as well and putting in those expenses? Yeah, that's what I would I would do um, the base plan and then start building up uh, alternative profiles. You know, call it uh, you know uh, six year nursing home experience, right? Um, and then you add that profile, and then you under you know, you add uh, special expenses and then you put in, add an expense and you put in the nursing home, the costs, the, the length of it, exactly when it's going to start, when it's going to stop, and then you run it. And then you can compare with your base profile and say, well, gee, now I've got to save up for this nursing home uh, episode. I'm going to have to be in the nursing home. It's going to be $120,000 a year for six years. I have to save up for it, or, and then I could set up an alternative profile, which is to buy a uh, long-term care policy and compare paying the premiums because they would be entered as special expenses. And then when the nursing home experience occurs, you would put in less for the um, expense because some of it would be covered by the nursing home insurance. And so you would enter two special expenses. One is paying uh, for the premiums and then also uh, having a lower net payment uh, once you do uh, go into the nursing home. And then you can see whether light, whether nursing home insurance seems to make some sense. Uh, clearly, things could cost more than 160000 They could cost less. You might never go to a nursing home. You might have a home health care worker. So you can run alternative profiles. Um, uh, you know, can run as many as you'd like. And we have people using our software for 20, well, at least 20 years now when we first brought out our desktop program. And some of them use it kind of almost as an addiction because they get so much value from it. They just keep using it over and over again. When something major changes, they immediately go and uh, change their inputs. And, you know, it could be downsizing your home, for example, you can tell the program you're going to change your home. Uh, my wife and I are in the process of moving to uh, Providence, Rhode Island. We found we have an apartment in uh, Boston. It's a rather small condo. And we realized um, by looking around, well, we wanted to have more space, but we really don't want to spend more money. And uh, it turns out that the housing cost per square foot for the same quality uh, of housing is literally a quarter as expensive in Providence. And it does mean I'm going to have to commute a little bit longer 
uh, than would otherwise be the case, but I can take the commuter train. Anyway, we used our, the software and we saw we could increase our lifetime discretionary spending and lower, lower our housing ex costs quite dramatically. And that, that's really what influenced our decision to actually pull the trigger and, um, and uh, move to Providence, which we're gonna be doing in about a month. Next question, Alex. Yeah, this sort of relates to that. Um, this is a question from Eric, uh, but a number, a number of people have actually asked this. Um, uh, my wife and I are already retired and receiving Social Security and withdrawing from our savings. It seems that this program lends it, lend itself to working individuals. Is it appropriate to me or is there a better tool? No, there's no better tool for sure. Uh, and absolutely, it's appropriate for somebody who's 80, for somebody who's I mean, suppose you're, uh, let's say, 75, your Social Security decisions are over, you, but your housing decisions are not necessarily over. You may decide to move into an assisted living facility or into a retirement community, and you want to see, can you afford it? Or which one, which of these communities could you afford? Or should you move to Texas, to Florida, where they don't have the state income tax and where it's warmer? Or maybe you have two homes. How much would it be worth it if we sold one of the homes and um, how much more can we um, uh, raise our annual spending, our living standard, because we are in effect house poor because we have to pay for this other home. So there's so many questions, but the key question for anybody at any age, including a 75 year old, is how much should I spend every year so that I don't run out of money? And that's the key question that uh, when you run the space profile or any of the profiles, uh, you get the answer to, and you get the answer right away because apart from the fixed expense expenditures, we're telling you how much to spend on a discretionary basis. That's this column right here every year in today's dollars. And if you keep running the program every year as things change or every so often, um, the you'll get a new number so you can adjust your spending but this is the key thing how much should i spend because it, it implies given your income and your fixed spending how much you're going to need to save and that saving is just recorded uh right here so this couple dan and sue need to save for a few years a fair amount because they're retiring pretty early and then uh it's going to be a couple of years before their retirement account money kicks in so they have to just save a lot, but then they start to saving much less. And uh, this is a plan which again um, ends up uh, with them dying exactly broke. So if there was some problem with this program in terms of the internal consistency, whether we, you know, uh, did we have some logic wrong? This thing would not be zero. This number would not correspond to that number, and uh, the balance sheet, lifetime balance sheet, would not balance within a dollar. Uh, we'd have all kinds of uh, inconsistencies, which we don't have, because when you work a problem for 27 years with uh, lots of terrific um, uh, engineers uh, um, at the uh, at your disposal, you get every, all the bugs out. Uh, it takes a long, long time, but in the end, everything works. Next question, Alex. So um, this is a question from Ben, and it kind of goes to what you were just covering. Um, he says, I've used Maxify for two years and I love the consumption smoothing idea, but I have a hard time understanding how much I should be saving to keep my standard of living in retirement. So, you know, what, maybe you want to talk about what it means to dissave or save and what, what are, you know, I, I kind of look at that, the annual savings and withdrawals uh, section as sort of a savings bucket. Maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah, right here, uh, a gentleman's name is Dan, is it Alex? It's Dan. Yeah, yeah. So Dan, the um, ben, so right ben, here, ben. Uh, ben, sorry, Ben. So Ben, here's the amount uh, that this couple needs to save, basically put money into their checking account or their savings account or some pr pretty safe um, security. Maybe they're buying tips, uh, inflation index bonds, 30-year tips. So they have to add to them and uh, well, actually, there's no reason to buy 30-year tips if, because the short-term. Well, they actually 30-year tips do do are doing better than than short-term tips, which have a negative return. Uh, to tell you the truth, right now. But this is the amount you need to add to your um, 
your checking or savings account basically uh, this year 68,000 if you were um, this couple and then you start withdrawing from your checking account here and you continue to withdraw now money is coming in this couple had started at the beginning of uh, the year with about $50,000 $50, in their checking account at the end of the year it um, the first year it ends up at 119 because they're adding to it so this is telling you how much to actually do an additional saving now one of the things that we're working on at a pretty furious clip right now is uh, orienting the program so that if you're using it let's say in june it just focuses on the rest of this year and your remaining future it doesn't kind of take you back to what you should have done uh, starting last January. Right now, the program is kind of oriented towards uh, people doing um, doing lifetime planning or, or annual planning on a lifetime basis, including for the first year, planning for the entire first year. But we're now uh, setting up the program, and we will have uh, you know a free upgrade to this to this uh, new version sometime. I hope by September or a little bit later, uh, where as soon as you run the program it will ask you uh, what's your current you know assets and uh, let's update all your numbers and from that and it will tell you how much to save over the rest of the year and how much to spend over the rest of the year and then what to do every year thereafter but it won't tell you what to do over the entire year because some part of the entire year is already passed so uh, so I hope I've communicated clearly what's coming we're always trying to improve the software. We have people working full time every single day. And many people are working uh, late hours, weekends, uh, because they they realize it's so important to our customers that uh, we provide them the very best tool because lots of important decisions are predicated upon it. What's your next question, Alex? This is a question from Catherine. Uh, does the algorithm for paying off mortgage Mortgage, the mortgage payments take take tax implications into account. Uh, yeah, we we are um, going right through the 1040 form, and we are figuring out whether or not you're going to you should be taking the standard deduction or itemizing your mortgages. We we do itemize all the itemizable deductions, but if it's less than the standard deduction, we then um, uh, uh, give you the standard deduction because we we do everything in a given year. It's going to lower that year's taxes. So absolutely, we're um, we're incorporating uh, your mortgage deduction. But for most people these days, because of the new tax law, the mortgage deduction is worth nothing. And indeed, uh, mortgages are a tax loser because if you borrowed money, let's say I borrow an extra hundred thousand dollars line of credit, and I put that money into bonds. Well, I'm not going to get most likely. I'm not going to get any additional tax break. On my taxes because the deductibility of the interest on the hundred thousand dollars is not going to matter because i'll be taking the standard deduction whereas i will have to pay taxes on the return on the bonds so on balance i've actually just lost money on taxes and probably the mortgage interest is going to exceed the, the interest i can earn on on the bond so it's also a financial loser so if you look at uh, uh go back to um our uh, website, which uh, I will do. I want to show you a couple columns that um, uh, I've written of late. That's here under articles, which uh, here's one about cashing out your 401k to pay off your mortgage. Last I look at it had almost a half a million uh, views. Here's some secrets about si uh, surviving the the greatest depression because I think that's what we're what we're in right now. Uh, the, the economic uh, situation is worse than the Great Depression at, at the moment. Maybe it'll hopefully clear up immediately, but that's where we're at. Uh, should you take Social Security early to weather the coronavirus? The answer basically is not. If you can avoid it, you, it's much better to take your retirement account money out early rather than your um, uh, to take Social Security early because Social Security provides you such a for sure, high real return for being patient. For most households, some households, uh, it'll be better to take the money early to get their disabled child benefits rolling or their uh, spouse, uh, child and care spouse benefit. 
Now, what about this? Does prepaying your mortgage be contributing to your 401k? Turns out for a lot of people that may be, the answer can be yes. Uh, we have, um, and then there's some, I haven't at all talked to you about all the fantastic things the software does in thinking about uh, risk analysis, your portfolio risk. That will be in a, a subsequent webinar where I talk about uh, how Maxify handles uh, risk analysis, portfolio risk analysis, but uh, it does some fantastic things there. The uh, Going back to, oh, let me just go back here. I wanted to show you the, um, we have some case studies that also get into this issue of uh, paying off your mortgage and uh, does prepaying your mortgage be contributing to your 401k? Um, there's that one. Are maggot mortgage tax and financial losers? Should we downsize? These are all case studies, uh, easy to follow. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's um, okay. Uh, that's that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's move on to another question here, which is uh, many people are asking about estate planning, uh, how to model inheritance. Uh, yeah, even uh, sort of long-term family planning. Uh, I think one uh, one uh, questioner uh, mentioned that he had a disabled son uh, that he wants to uh, engage in long-term planning for. Um, how does the program handle that? Okay, so um, the um, the way you would handle <clears throat> the outlays to basically endow your child with um, enough resources to cover their living standard through the end of their life would be, first of all, you'd have to really set up a, a program uh, for your son. You could either buy the uh, the planner tool, which is a little more money, uh, or just buy another license for your son, which would be less expensive, and set up your son as a single person if they're not married. and enter any sources of income. They might be getting SSI benefits. They might get this child disability benefits, uh, disabled child benefits from Social Security at the point that you start collecting your retirement benefit. The, uh, uh, we have in our program in Maxify, we ask about SSI benefits because uh, we know that the, the disabled child benefit is gonna be reduced dollar for dollar by the SSI benefit. So you can find by running your program how much uh, the child will get on net from uh, from your uh, social security record during the period you're alive. And then if you enter a, a date at which you were uh, some maximum age of life, uh, how much the survivor benefit will be for the child at that point. Uh, you can figure that out as well. And we can help you with that. But anyway, under your record, <clears throat> what you would do is enter the payments to your child if you're trying to endow some, let's say, trust fund for your child, you would enter that as a special expense. So you plug it in right here. You click on it. If, if we're dealing with your child's uh, uh, profile, if we're now, if you've now set up a Maxify account for your child and this is now your child's base plan, then for the child, it's going to show up as a special receipt. So you want to enter the income the child is going to be receiving for you, from you. You'd have an enter another special receipt, which is um, for uh, you know you'd save that one. You'd enter that one how much you're giving your kid. You then enter a new one for how much the child's receiving from SSI <clears throat> uh, uh, and other sources, including uh, uh, child disability benefits from Social Security. Uh, any additional assets the child might already have. So all the sources of, 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 of revenues, of receipts for the child, you would enter and then you would figure out what the child can spend on an ongoing basis uh, just by running the child's base plan, uh, just like you would run your own base plan. And for you, let me just say one last thing. If you're specifying that you're going to be making these payments, then as special expenses, then um, you want to make sure that your plan does not incorporate any income like child benefits that might be going to your kid. So uh, you may need to uh, tell the plan that you have 
another special expense, which is the benefits, the, the child benefits that your plan is telling you you're receiving, but you're actually handing those. Well, I can actually, if you just hand, enter those in uh, one time, that will uh, nullify the fact that you're getting the money in uh, from Social Security. So just uh, make sure that money that's going to the kid is not somehow being counted for you to uh, raise your living standard because it's really going to be raising your child's living standard, not your living standard. Right. I, and then I think just for inheritance, uh, maybe you want to just oh. talk about how to run a special bequest or... Um, under right. uh, settings and assumption, you come in here under estate planning and you can enter, first of all, whether or not you're, um, you want your survivors to have the same living standard. Some people are not insurable. So if we're talking about a 70-year-old couple and they can't get their buy life insurance because it's just way too expensive, then they would have to specify a lower living standard if they were to die for the survivor. And then the program will not recommend life insurance. Um, the, um, uh, you can also specify for each person a special bequest. So for example, if Dan put in here $500,000 uh, or let's say $1.5 million for a child, then the program would know that that needs to be covered regardless of when Dan dies. So if Dan's going to die this year and they don't have $1.5 million available to them because they might have some in the retirement accounts, but they're not getting to that, that money, then the program is going to figure out that, they need, that Dan needs more life insurance than is being recommended in order to cover that, uh, that liability, that obligation. So the special requests that you enter here and for Sue are potentially going to trigger life insurance uh, needs. Uh, but if we're dealing with a, a couple where the child would be living with the uh, survivor and uh, the survivor would be taking care of the, that person, well, then you might want to enter a special gift to the child under special expenses, specify a gift that um, maybe leave the child uh, $500,000 when uh, the, uh, the couple is age 80, for example. That's another way to deal with uh, this entire estate planning, which is to, to uh, plan to make gifts. And gifts are entered in our program as special expenses. Uh, or again, you can make enter uh, special requests. Alex, next question. Um, a number of people have asked about, I'll try to answer this question. A number of people have asked about um, security, security of people's uh, data. And um, I just want to uh, say that um, we have a privacy policy that's uh, uh, written out and very robust. And um, I, I, I would just uh, uh, suggest looking at the, our privacy policy to see uh, that we're uh, taking extra care to make sure that all of your data is uh, secure and anonymous. Um, and if, let me just add a couple things here. Uh, we have a chief technology officer who could um, uh, talk about our security ar arrangements for about three hours, and uh, but because he's, he's very much on top of that. Uh, one of the things you can do uh, that's very simple is just not enter your real names. There's no reason that you would need to, uh, you can enter, run the program anonymously. We do have, um, uh, we are using Amazon Web Servers. They have their own uh, security systems and privacy uh, arrangements. We do pay a company to try to break into our website uh, on a routine basis. We've been doing that for years. We've never had right. any, any problem with security or loss of data, and we hope never to have one. Uh, so we are trying to do everything we can to uh, ensure everybody's uh, data is perfectly secure. Uh, right. So, so yeah. Um, so I suggest everyone just looks at their at our privacy policy if uh, if you're concerned about that. Um, but let me move on to another question from David. Um, he says, if things start going south, say because of runaway inflation, will the software make suggestions, or do I always need to suggest possibilities? Well, what we do periodically, basically every six months, uh, is our is my thinking is uh, specify under settings and assumptions what we think the prevailing uh, 
prevailing uh, returns are in the market, the safe returns and the in inflation rate. So right now the market is suggesting a zero real return for investing long terms in a safe way and that the inflation rate is roughly one and a quarter percent and the uh, long-term nominal bond yield is around that. You can change these numbers. You can use whatever numbers you want, but so we do change the defaults, but we try and uh, limit our communication to our customers to the max maximum extent possible because we don't want to be um, bothering or in any way harassing our, our customers. I post um, uh, via Twitter, and you can learn via Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I, and I post uh, every article the same day it comes out. I post it on our website under our articles. I post, uh, we post case days. We'll have a couple more posted and probably later today. Uh, press articles we post right away. So whenever I'm trying to communicate something, I usually write some kind of an article for typically for Forbes about uh, my thinking. But uh, you won't be getting automatic emails saying, look, the market went up 20%, change your behavior this today. Uh, occasionally you might get some, you'll see an article that says, look, things are a lot riskier and because it's risky, riskier, we need to start timing the market, not so much because we think we can know what the market's going to do, but because things are riskier. And when things are riskier, we have to take precaution because we're risk averse people. And taking precaution means uh, reducing our exposure to the to things that are risky, including the stock market. So you'll occasionally see me writing columns like that. I mean, there's uh, uh, if you go to kotlikoff.net, you'll see all my articles, all my columns, including the ones I post on our um, company's websites. But some of the columns are focused on things like my best stock stock tip, and I wrote a column a few months ago saying my best stock tip was to sell your get out of the stock market. And I'm kind of partly right on that tip and partly wrong because the market went down a lot. I was looking very good to my kids and then it started going back up and now I'm not looking so good. So I, I don't have all the answers for sure. Um, Thanks. Well, uh, so a number of people are asking about uh, Monte Carlo and, you know, we're not, uh, showing that today, it's sort of a it, it's a it's a fairly complicated piece of the software, and I think we're going to have a webinar that's solely devoted to that. But maybe you want to just say a few words about what Monte Carlo is. Uh, yeah, the Monte Monte Carlo. Uh, we're going to have a webinar probably in early July that looks at our Monte Carlo risk analysis, and we invite everybody to come join us. And again, all our webinars are going to be posted so people can. Uh, View them afterward. They're being recorded. Uh, just go to um, you know our, our website. Click on um, you know for households or for planners, and you'll see a, an item that says webinars. Go there, and you'll see the videos of the prior webinars. But the Monte Carlo is um, is working the way economics says uh, to look at investing in risky securities. You need to focus on two things. One is how aggressively are you investing? The other is how aggressively are you spending through time? These two things control how much downside risk you're gonna face. So what we do is we ask people to tell us how they're investing right now. You know, Is it, let's say, 50-50 stocks and bonds? And are you gonna keep 50-50 through time? So we ask them what their current base um, uh, investment strategy is. And then we ask them, how aggressively are they going to spend? And I'll get into the details of how we ask that question when, when we get into the webinar. But we basically ask how aggressively they're going to be spending. And then we run the program. Uh, and, and what we do is uh, we're running uh, 500 trajectories of how your living standard could turn out through time under the assumption that every year, um, once you get the returns you get, based on how aggressively you're spending, you do the spending, um, you adjust your spending either up or down based on whether you did poorly or well in the stock market. So these trajectories, each of the 500 trajectories is a path of your living standard through time. And we're making 500 of these paths. And so that's, think of that as a collection of 500 Monte Carlo 
uh, trajectory paths. And then we do another 500 for a safe investment strategy and another 500 for a risky investment strategy. And then we uh, show you these profiles. We show you uh, basically the, the you know, 95th highest percentile profile and the fifth percentile lowest profile. We show you the upside and the downside from this strategy, the base strategy, from the risky strategy, from the uh, safe strategy. And then we do something very special that no program on the planet except ours does, which is we take all these numbers. If you're age 50 and we have 50 trajectories and you're going to make it to possibly 100, that's 2,500 um, numbers that you have to look at. And it's very difficult to make an evaluation about 2,500 numbers, let alone this set of 2,500 numbers, and then there's this set of 2,500 numbers, and then there's a third set of 2,500 outcomes. Very hard to compare those. So what we do is we plug these um, outcomes into what's called a lifetime happiness function. It's like a mathematical measure of your average lifetime happiness. And uh, the lifetime happiness takes into account the fact that you're a lot happier uh, uh, from getting um, extra uh, consumption when you're not consuming a lot and, and not that much happier if you're already doing really well. So it takes into account your risk aversion, the, the, your satiation that I talked about at the beginning of the webinar, the fact that the 20th cupcake after you've had 19 doesn't taste as good as the first cupcake. It takes that into account. It's the standard happiness function, mathematical function that economists have been using for years that all the top um, work in finance that has led to Nobel Prizes has been predicated upon. It's called the constant relative risk aversion utility function for those who are uh, nerds like me. And we show a comparison of your expected lifetime happiness from using your base strategy, your current strategy versus the safe strategy versus the risky strategy. And you can set up these three, th three strategies as you'd like. So you can use our software tool to figure out what's the, uh, the best portfolio and spending behavior for you to adopt. So this is a, a, a means of using economics, uh, economic science to figure out how you should be investing and how you should be uh, spending. Uh, so it's pretty unique. We've only had it out in our program for about, I would say, about a year at this point. And, uh, it's a hidden gem, and I'm going to take you through the whole thing, kit and caboodle, in a few uh, few weeks. But also, if you click on the help file here, uh, you can look at some video tutorials. And one of the tutorials is a, um, let's see, one of these at the bottom here should be a tutorial that I did. It's a web, it's a video that I actually speak through, which goes about 10 minutes. Uh, I don't have a great presentation, uh, uh, speaking voice, so you may find it boring, but it's going to take you through everything we do in our risk analysis. So if you click on this video, if you just go to your help um, and then come to um, video tutorials and then go to the last one, this video will uh, explain precisely how our risk analysis works and will um, be pretty much what I'm gonna be saying in our webinar when, when I give that webinar in a few weeks. Um, so a couple of people have asked about, um, you know, does the program uh, calculate state taxes uh, or does it as well as federal taxes or does it just do federal taxes? And then uh, sort of following that, uh, Stephen asked, you know, how, ac how accurate are the state level tax calculations? Uh, because a lot of software tools only use approximations. Uh, yeah, we go through um, the, uh, hang on one second, let me just get back to the program. We go through every state tax return. They're equivalent to their 1040 form. We're going through each one of them. There are 42 states. We're working off each one of those forms and we have, uh, we assign an engineer to work on state taxes, updating the state taxes and that person spends roughly four months trying to make sure every state income tax is done per, uh, precisely. And certain states have different provisions that are quite esoteric, and we try and make sure we 
handle them. And occasionally we have uh, a client who says, gee, you left out, you're taxing me too high. Um, you left out this special deduction for people over 65 in my particular state. Maybe it's Missouri. And then we go back and say, you're right, we left that out. We're going to add that. And we add it. So we try and do um, a really detailed uh, job on state taxes as well as federal taxes. And uh, that, that's my answer. There's no approximations. The, the Social Security system has, you know, if you just think about what we're doing on Social Security, it has 2,728 rules, but it has literally hundreds of thousands of rules in its program operating manual system about the 2,728 rules, which govern the 12 different benefits the system provides, uh, 11 of which we cover. We don't cover uh, parental benefits, ben benefits going to parents. And we have a, a person uh, who uh, was a Social Security uh, technical advisor, worked for Social Security for 30 years, and he's been uh, working for us for many, many years now. His name is Jerry Lutz, and he knows these hundreds of thousands of rules inside, inside and out. So if there's something we can't figure out, we immediately ask Jerry. He's, that's his job. And we uh, are just meticulous. Our Social Security code is much longer than our federal income tax because Social Security is, is if you can believe it, far more complicated than the entire federal, tax, federal income tax uh, code when it gets down to it. It's that crazy. So if you want to convince yourself of how crazy Social Security is uh, and what we've been uh, struggling with, the details, go to the program operating manual system of the Social Security uh, system. Just uh, Google uh, that POMS, POMS, SSA, doc, SSA for Social Security Administration, and you will then and start clicking through all those rules, and you will see what we've been um, uh, trying to get 100% straight. And I believe we, uh, we may not have every single provision, but we've been working at this full time with uh, the former head of research of the Army Corps of Engineers is our, Mike O'Connor is our chief social security engineer. And Mike's about 75 and he's been working for us for about 10 years. And I would say about 90% of his time he's been spending on social security. So let me start, uh, take some more questions here, Alex. Okay, uh, I think we're getting close to 3.30 and we still have uh, probably hundreds of questions maybe here. Uh, we still have a lot of people on the line. Uh, I just wanna say if we don't get to your question today, feel free to email me at alex at economicsecurityplanning.com and I'll uh, try to get back to you. Um, several people have uh, asked about really what are the differences between discretionary spending and uh, fixed spending or non-discretionary spending. And uh, given that, how do you include a budget, you know, buying groceries and things like that? Uh, yeah, so what we asked you to do is um, enter uh, uh, special expenses that are things that you really have to spend money on uh, the taxes are obviously a fixed expense. You can't get around those. You can try and minimize those by doing things like Roth conversions and, and dealing appropriately with the, when to take your retirement account money out. And uh, But uh, your housing expenses, unless you sell your house or change your housing situation, they're fixed. So we suggest people put in a minimum, a modicum of uh, fixed expenses and what exactly they put in, uh, they can decide freely because they can enter whatever special expenses they want. But then the rest of the money, we suggest people use our uh, budgeting routine. And let me uh, just go back here to um, somehow I lost uh, my uh, reference point here. Hold on. Well, I, yeah, the, um, I'm not sure what happened. I'm just gonna, oh, here we go, let's see. Log in, let me just see if I can do this really quickly. If not, I'll just say what I wanna say. Uh, return to calculator, here we go. Okay, so after you run the base plan, 
here's the base, I clicked on reports, I'm running the base plan for Dan and Sue. We have a whole budgeting module set up here, which may a lot of people may not see, because, and we're gonna make it more apparent in the future to make it easier for people to, to see. But if you kind of toggle down from this very first screen, which has got your lifetime balance sheet, uh, you come to um, set up your progress, um, set up your 2020 progress tracker. And here we say, uh, look, we're just summarizing your total income for 2020. Uh, it's basically labor income. You're not getting any withdrawals from retirement accounts or social security money. Uh, we give you a little bit of a picture of what you're spending money on, on a fixed basis, uh, housing expenses, and you have to do some saving and you have some property taxes and so forth. Uh, but then we say, okay, look, uh, you've got this much discretionary spending to do this year, $88,000. Now, if you use a typical budget, you can click on one of these two things. Let's click on this. Well, here's what we budget you to spend uh, on uh, utilities and tell us how much you actually are gonna spend on utilities. If it's gonna be bigger or lower, just adjust that. And uh, in the end, we'll show you how much you budgeted and how much you have left. In this case, based on these typical budget allocations, you have just $3 left. So here's where you can figure out whether you're overspending. You can look at your monthly um, uh, outlays from your credit card uh, statements and other sources to say, well, gee, I'm not, not spending $15.48 a month on utilities. I'm only spending $300 a month. So you just change that to uh, whatever, $300 a month. And then you say, well, I got more money to spend. I've got not, you know, a thousand bucks not yet budgeted. Let me see where I can spend it. Maybe I want to spend it more on entertainment, increase that budget. So this is how you can go back and forth and live within the budget we're recommending. So this is our budgeting. And again, we're going to make this much more prominent because I think a lot of people just don't realize that it's here uh, tucked away under, um, the lifetime budget report you just scroll down and go to the progress tracker and that's where you're going to see it and by the way um, eventually when we start doing end of year planning we hope to be also uh, being able to pull in your account balances that you currently have at the time you do the planning uh, automatically that's called account aggregation we ex hope to uh, we're working on that too at the same time so that you'll be able to immediately see, gee, I've got this much in my Fidelity account or my Charles Schwab account. Yesterday it was a lower amount, today's a higher amount, but anyway, this is my amount today. And uh, we also may be able to uh, have people enter their expenditures uh, if they're dealing with Mint or some other budget tracking uh, application, cell phone application, uh, we may be able to uh, pull in those data as well through time. Uh, another question. Why don't we wait? Why don't we uh, do a few more questions? Maybe like three more questions, Alex, and then let people uh, off the hook and do other things. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, here's a question. Uh, <clears throat> a number of people are just asking about what our prices are uh, for uh, household versions versus the uh, the uh, planners version, and also what is the difference between premium and standard? Okay, so the, the household version comes in two flavors. One is, uh, the, the one flavor is, uh, let me just go over here to sign up. So for households, you would uh, you could buy a basic uh, license, which is uh, uh, the Maxify tool. It runs one household, not 20 households. You can make as many alternative profiles as you want, but you can only have one household. So if you're trying to do this for yourself and for your son who's disabled, you probably want to buy two licenses, uh, one for yourself and one for your son. Now, the premium version costs a little bit more, 40 bucks more, but this gives you access to our risk analysis, to our Monte Carlo uh, risk analysis that I was telling you about. So that's the only difference between these two. The pro version, the only difference between the pro version and the premium version is that the pro version lets you um, enter uh, up to 100 households. So if you wanted, if you're a professional and you wanted to 
you know, run this for your clients. You would uh, buy the professional version and uh, you could set up uh, up to 100 clients. If you have uh, 200 clients, we'd expect you to buy two licenses uh, to cover those two clients so we can interact with you on that. But basically all the functionality that's in the pro version is in the premium version. All the functionality that's in the premium version is in the pro version. The only difference is the pro version can run, can set up many, many households. Just like when I was looking, you know, I've been running the pro version for you folks. And you can see if I click on here, I, I, I can open my client list and I have a lot of different clients loaded up here. This is uh, Howard Gold is a reporter for Market Watch. I was doing a, a bunch of runs to help him with a column that he was writing and that's now posted on our website. So uh, if you're a financial planner, you will have a client list. If you're not, uh, you'll just, uh, you know, your program will kind of look like this. And as soon as you click on your base profile, you'll see your data and then you can open up your data and you can click on people's names and add things that have been dismissed. We're trying keeping, we're trying through time to make the interface as easy as possible, as intuitive. Uh, and we still have ways to go on that, but we are working on it. Next question, Alex. Yeah, what do you do if uh, you already have a life insurance policy? Where do you enter that? How does it, how does the program figure, figure that in? Well, you could um, tell the program that you don't want uh, the program to recommend any life insurance. So here you for could example, tell the program you want the living standard of the client to fall by 99% of the survivor. And that will tell clue the program when it runs its calculations to recommend zero life insurance. And then what you could do is just enter your life insurance premiums as uh, special expenses your projected life experience, and then just know that you have enough life insurance. Uh, I would run the thing with this not change from zero just to see how much life insurance you need. And if you need, um, if you have more life insurance than the program says you need, then you'll know that the survivor is gonna have a higher living standard. We only recommend life insurance when a survivor needs that money to have the same living standard. If we recommend no life insurance in a given year, it means that if that the spouse or partner dies in that year, the survivor will actually be better off. So, uh, and we have survivor reports here, by the way, that you can run. You can tell the program, hey, I'd like to see what happens uh, if I'm the survivor, if I shoot Dan or kill Dan uh, in, uh, let's say, seven, six years, I'm going to have Dan die one way or the other. I've had it with Dan. I'm going to see how I'm going to do without Dan. Well, then you run a survivor report. And you're going to see everything about your life as a survivor if Dan dies exactly at age 65. And uh, I'm just kidding about uh, shooting Dan. Dan's a great guy. And uh, Sue and Dan are very happy. So <laughs> nobody should shoot anybody. We have enough problems with more, more mortality at this point. Uh, so just kidding. Next question, Alex. Let's make this the last question and then we'll let other people um, uh, get back to other things. Yeah, okay. So many people are asking about um, how does the program model any sort of future changes to Social Security, like reduction of benefits or in, an increase or, uh, or even uh, uh, future changes in the inflation or interest rates? Okay, uh, very good question. So uh, on the last part here, um, uh, you can specify under settings and assumptions is like all these tabs. So I, I would encourage people to go through all the tabs and see all the inputs, but will future will inflation change? So if you think that starting in four years, inflation is going to be 10%, it could be because the Fed is printing a prodigious amount of money. It, it, they're opening up the uh, printing press like crazy and the treasury is borrowing money and the Fed is just buying up those, basically just, uh, you know, the Fed borrows money, gives somebody a yellow orange piece of paper and the Fed prints green piece of paper and uses that to buy up the orange pieces of paper. So in the end, the government's just printing green pieces of paper to buy things or to give pe uh, people money. So we could have high inflation. If you want to explore it, you just use this thing right here. Um, change the inflation rate starting in the year you want. 
As for Social Security, you can tell the program that, gee, I think starting in uh, six years, uh, uh, maybe it's four years, well, maybe it's uh, 10 years, that Social Security is going to be reduced by 20% for me. And uh, then you run the program. You don't even have to save it. It saves automatically. And then you just run your base plan all over again. Or you could set up a new profile, not screw around with your base plan, leave this at zero and have basically no change, but set up an alternative plan, plan which is uh, Social Security benefit is cut. And then you add that profile and now you're in that profile and then you go here, settings and assumptions, and you go here and you say, okay, 20, 30, Social Security is going to be cut by minus 30%. And now you're done, and now you're ready to run a comparison of, if you, if you click on reports, now you can compare the profile you're on with your base profile and run it and see what happens. And I don't want to depress anybody by running this, but it's going to, well, I'll run it. What the heck? It's going to lead to a, a major reduction in uh, the living standard of these this couple because, okay, so they've lost about not as bad as I thought. Uh, the base plan is higher than the uh, Social Security is cut plan by about $300,000. It's not so bad because it's not happening for, for 10 years. So that's... Um, the key thing. And we will probably through time start pro trying to provide people other options for how they might uh, cut Social Security. As we see uh, bills uh, that the me members of the Congress are putting forth that look highly likely to be adopted or actually are adopted, if they are adopted, we're going to try and fix our software, update our software overnight. When we had the uh, the 2015 changes to Social Security, we had our, which were extensive, we updated our software within two weeks, faster than any other program. When they, when they changed the, uh, the tax law in 2017, we immediately updated our program. And we now give you the option when you run our software of, um, you know, of, of, of using the new tax law or the old tax law, because the new tax law says that starting in um, uh, in a future year, uh, I think it's like 2028, that uh, the tax law is going to be uh, revert back to what it was. That's the current law. That's what we're using. We're assuming that the taxes, the tax provisions go back to what they were. If you want to assume that taxes are going to, that were changed in 2017 are going to be permanent, you would want to click on this. We have chosen this because, as the default, because that's the most conservative. We're always trying to plan in the safest way possible for everybody using the program. But you do have the option right here to um, uh, to change the uh, law back to, uh, to make it permanent. The changes to keep the law the, exactly the way it's written, which is that it's going to revert back to what it was. Or if you just want to compare, hey, how would I have been? How would I be doing today? If they hadn't had that tax reform, you can run it with this thing turned on. So lots of uh, things you can play around with under these uh, setting and assumptions options. Let me uh, stop there. Let me thank everybody. Let me um, again encourage everybody to tell your friends, colleagues, uh, relatives about our software. And I want to just thank everybody for their support uh, for our company. But more important, I want to uh, encourage everybody to be as extremely safe as possible. Keep your distance, wear your masks, uh, do as little uh, in the way of contacting other, uh, being getting too close to people as possible because uh, this is a very, very deadly and dangerous uh, uh, plague that we're in the middle of and uh, we do not yet have it under control. So thank you and God bless you and stay safe. Thank you everyone, bye-bye.